Quantum entanglement allows particles to be linked, regardless of the space between them. This is so counterintuitive that even Einstein didn't think it was true. In today's episode of Kiskit in the Classroom, we'll talk about how Bell's theorem proved Einstein wrong. Welcome to Kiskit in the Classroom. In this series, we'll use Qiskit to explore some fundamental concepts commonly covered in quantum computing related courses. Each video will also be accompanied by an interactive module linked in the description below, so be sure to check that out. In the Quantum Coins video, we discussed how measuring a quantum superposition is an inherently probabilistic process, like flipping a coin in some ways. But how do we know this? Could it be that a quantum particle secretly hides a predetermined outcome of a measurement, but we somehow fail to capture this information in our theory? In the early days of quantum mechanics, this question was the subject of heated debate, with two main factions. In one camp was Einstein, who believed that quantum mechanics was incomplete. That is, that it was missing some variables that were necessary to fully describe a system. Einstein thought that these so-called hidden variables, if found, would resolve some of the seemingly paradoxical and probabilistic aspects of quantum mechanics. In the other camp was Max Born. Born argued that the probabilistic description given by quantum mechanics is all that is specified by nature. In other words, it isn't just that we don't know the state of a particle prior to measuring it, it's that the particle has no definite state before it's measured. For decades, many thought this disagreement was a philosophical question that might never be resolved. After all, in order to learn anything about a system, we need to measure it. How can we possibly learn anything about the nature of a state prior to its measurement? Then in 1964, the physicist John Bell found a way. In his paper, Bell examined the statistical correlations between measurements of a pair of entangled particles. If prior to measurement, the states of the particles were determined by some unknown hidden variables, then Bell found that their correlations had an upper limit. On the other hand, when he calculated the correlations predicted by quantum mechanics, he found that they violated this limit. So he had found a way to once and for all differentiate between Einstein and Born's view. All that remained was to actually experimentally test these correlations with real particles to see whether they obeyed the hidden variable statistics or they violated that rule. These tests were performed with increasing precision and sophistication over the years, and they're some of the most significant experiments of modern physics. They were so groundbreaking that they earned three physicists the Nobel Prize in 2022. But these days, anyone can perform a Bell test. All we need is a little knowledge of Qiskit and access to an IBM quantum computer. In this video, I'm going to walk you through the logic of Bell's inequality. Then I'll show you how we can test Bell's predictions on an IBM quantum computer. Bell's inequality involves a few different measurements and layers of logic, and it can be a little tricky to follow. But we'll go through it step by step, and in the end, it'll be worth it. We're about to show that entanglement is real and Einstein is wrong. That's not something many people can say they've done. So here's what Bell proposed. Let's say you have a way to produce many copies of an entangled pair of particles. Physically, these pairs could be produced through a decay process where one particle decays into two. If you watch the video on the stern gerlach experiment, you know that particles can have an intrinsic angular momentum called spin. Say one spin zero particle decays into two spin one half particles. Then each of the spin one half particles can be measured to have either spin plus one half or minus one half. Also called spin up or spin down. But since they decayed from a spin zero particle, then the two must combine to have a total spin of zero also. So if one is measured to be up, the other must be down and vice versa. These particles form an entangled pair that looks like this.
So if one is measured to be up, the other one is down and vice versa. Let's say particle one flies off to the left or the minus x direction where a researcher, who we'll call Lucas, measures its spin. Then, particle two similarly flies off to the right, where another researcher, Rihanna, can measure that spin. Lucas and Rihanna can independently rotate their measurement devices to choose to measure the spin of their respective particles along any direction perpendicular to the particle's direction of motion. If we send many copies of the entangled state to Lucas and Rihanna, they can collect measurement statistics. If they always measure along the same axis, these statistics will not be very interesting. Every time one measures spin up, the other measures spin down. And every time one measures spin forward, the other measures spin backward, and so on. But if the two researchers measure along different axes, we may find something more interesting. Let's give Lucas and Rihanna three axes along which to measure. We'll call these axes A, B, and C, and they're each separated by 120 degrees. The question we will ask with this experiment is, if Lucas and Rihanna are free to measure along any of the three axes, how often will the two obtain the same sign? Clearly, if Lucas and Rihanna happen to measure along the same axis, say axis A, they can never get the same sign since the particles must combine to have spin zero. But when they pick different axes, how will their measurements be correlated, if at all? According to Einstein, this quantum mechanical description of the particle state is incomplete. He thought there must exist hidden variables that predetermine the outcome of all possible spin measurements, since without that, entangled particles would have to somehow communicate the outcome of their measurement to one another instantaneously. If one was measured to be up way over here, the other must instantaneously know to be down over here. These hidden variables could be any complicated set of instructions for the outcome of experiments. But the point is that the spin state of each particle separately is determined, so no communication is necessary. Experimentally, that would mean that measurements made by Lucas would have no effect on Rihanna's particle and vice versa. This could put some limits on how correlated the two measurements can be. According to Born though, this state psi is all that can be said about the pair of particles prior to measurement. So the measurement of one particle affects the outcome of the measurement of the other. This may have different implications for the correlations between measurements. Let's see how each theory affects these correlations. In the hidden variables treatment, there's a secret set of instructions prior to measurement that already determines what Lucas will measure along each of the three axes. For example, these instructions could be positive if Lucas measures along an axis A, positive if he measures along B, and negative if he measures along C. We can write this as plus A plus B and minus c. Then Rihanna's particle would need to have the variables minus a, minus b, and plus c to make sure that the total spin along any single direction is zero. There are eight sets of possible instructions that satisfy this spin zero constraint. So each time a new pair of particles is sent to Lucas and Rihanna, it could contain any one of these eight sets of instructions. So now we wanna figure out, assuming the particles contain one of the secret sets of instructions given in the table, and assuming that Lucas and Rihanna each independently choose which of the three axes to measure along, what is the probability that they both measure the same sign? If the instructions are those given in rows one or eight, then clearly this probability is zero since the two particles will have the opposite signs regardless of their measurement axes. But what about the instructions in row two? They would measure the same signs if Rihanna measured along C and Lucas measured along either A or B, or if Lucas measured along C and Rihanna measured along either A or B. 
So that's four out of nine of the possible measurement combinations that will give Lucas and Rihanna the same sign. If we do this for each set of the instructions, you'll see that rows three through seven also give a probability of four ninths. This means that if Einstein is right and hidden variables like these predetermine the outcome of measurements, there's no way for Lucas and Rihanna to ever measure the same sign with probability greater than four ninths. This is the Bell inequality, P less than or equal to four ninths. And as we'll show, entangled particles violate this. So to see what quantum mechanics predicts, say Lucas measures long A, two things can happen. Either he measures spin up, so Rihanna would measure spin down along A, or he measures spin down and Rihanna would measure spin up along A. But we want the probability that Rihanna measures the same sign as Lucas along any axis of her choosing, not just A. If she measures along either B or C, it gets a little complicated. It turns out that if you know what Rihanna will measure with 100% certainty along one direction, then you can calculate the probabilities that she will measure up or down along any other axis with a little geometry. If your state always measures spin up along one axis, then the probability of measuring spin up along a different axis will be equal to the square of the cosine of one half of the angle between the two axes. That's a little complicated, but I'll show you what I mean. If Lucas measures spin up along A, we know with 100% certainty Rihanna would measure spin down if she were to measure along A. So we can represent that with a vector like this. In this case, the angles between this vector and the other two measurement axes, B and C, are both 60 degrees. So one half of that is 30 degrees, and cosine of 30 is shown here. Cosine squared of 30 degrees equals 3 fourths. Now what if Lucas measures spin down along A? We know Rihanna would measure spin up along A, so we can draw another vector here. Now this vector representing this knowledge is 120 degrees from each of the other two axes, B and C. So we can do the same geometry trick, but this time we'll get cosine of 60 degrees. So cosine squared of 60 degrees equals 1 fourth. Since Lucas is equally likely to measure spin up and spin down along A, we need to average these two probabilities of Rihanna's. We end up with a final probability that Rihanna will measure the same sign as Lucas of 1 half. So P equals 1 half. 1 half is bigger than 4 ninths, so Bell's inequality is violated. That means that as long as the rules of quantum mechanics hold, hidden variables are impossible. Now we can use Qiskit and an IBM quantum computer to test the Bell inequality with real quantum measurements. We can map the spin up and spin down states of Lucas and Rihanna's particles to the zero and one states of the qubits in the quantum computer. We'll take two qubits, one to represent Lucas's particle, and one for Rihanna's, and entangle them with this quantum circuit. So the two qubits are represented by the two wires, Q0 and Q1, and this combination of X, Hadamard, and C0 gates will make the same entangled state we had between Lucas and Rihanna's particles. Now we need to measure each qubit. We'll set Lucas's measurement to be along A, which we'll say is the Z axis. Then Rihanna's measurement can be along A, B, or C. So we'll need three separate circuits for each of these three cases, but in this video, we'll just do one. You can go to the module linked in the description for the full thing. If Rihanna measures along B, then our circuit looks like this, where Ry is a rotation of 120 degrees to change Rihanna's measurement axis. We can use the Qiskit primitive sampler to run this experiment many times and collect statistics from the resulting measurements. The two columns, 0, 0, and 1, 1 represent the times when Lucas and Rihanna measured the same sign, which is what we're after. 
So the probability of measuring both particles to have the same sign is very nearly one half. This violates Bell's inequality. This means that the two particles are entangled. Each one somehow seems to instantaneously know the result of a measurement of the other. There's still some disagreement about how exactly to interpret this entanglement and what happens when you measure an entangled state. But these questions are more philosophical. The theory is pretty undeniable at this point. Entanglement is definitely real. And we know this thanks to Bell, his inequality, and the many physicists who have performed experiments to test it. If you'd like to be counted among those physicists and perform your own Bell test with a quantum computer, be sure to head over to the Bell's inequality module linked in the description. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.